thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, Indonesia is in the center of the news with a meeting of the G20 last week and with a fantastic article in The Economist published this week about the great growth potential of Indonesia. It's really a pity that I cannot be there to observe it with you. I would have loved to be in Bali. I would have loved to get back to Jakarta. I hope, I hope next year that can happen. But in the meantime, I'm really, really honored to be able to share with you some ideas. And I'm going to start immediately by sharing my screen. I hope the technology works fine. So I'm going to be thinking about uh, the unique role that manufacturing plays in economic growth. And I'm going to try to make my remarks as relevant to Indonesia as possible. Um, as we know, um, um, I'm going to start by assessing Indonesia's growth performance. I'm going to assess uh, the contribution of manufacturing to Indonesia's growth. Um, I'm going to explain in my framework why is manufacturing so important. And I'm going to finish by adding some uh, new avenues for growth, um, uh, which I'm going to talk about business services and the implications of green growth. So that's uh, the path of where we're going. Uh, this is a description of, of growth in, in the region. As we know, yeah, there's been a remark, a, a lot of uh, growth in the region, seen from Latin America, seen from uh, my part of the world. We all look uh, with envy at uh, at uh, uh, the growth in the region. We see that um, uh, um, Indonesia has made enormous progress. Uh, it has been overtaken by by China, but it has remained uh, on a path that is quite similar to that of. Indonesia and Malaysia, if we take an index uh, equal to 100 the year before the East Asian crisis, we see that uh, China and Vietnam have had uh, remarkable growth, but uh, the rest of the countries, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, uh, all exhibited very similar growth over the, uh, the period since the East Asian crisis. Now, if you look at, a man at productivity, uh, here I have a graph that shows the, the productivity in the manufacturing sector, in the service sector, and the, in agriculture in Indonesia. And essentially what this graph shows is that uh, manufacturing in Indonesia is three times more productive than services, than average services. Services are very heterogeneous and more or less uh, twice as productive as agriculture. So this is going to be important for growth because the higher the share of workers in manufacturing, uh, the more will be the total uh, productivity of the economy. Um, here, what we have is the share of employment in, in Indonesia in manufacturing, the share of um, manufacturing in GDP, and the relative productivity of manufacturing. What's interesting is that even though manufacturing is much more productive than the rest of, of the country, uh, the share of employment has been growing. Uh, the share in GDP has been declining, and that's because uh, services and agriculture have been narrowing their huge productivity gap uh, with, with manufacturing. Uh, so this is what you would expect to see in a healthy growth process, that workers move into manufacturing and that uh, the productivity levels of manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the economy converge. Now, Indonesia has more manufacturing employment than would be expected for its income level. It's uh, slightly below some of the regional comparators like Vietnam, China, and Thailand. And interestingly, while in the world, uh, since 1996, there's been a general decline in the share of manufacturing employment. Uh, manufacturing employment in Indonesia has been rising. Uh, so, so those are uh, two important uh, elements. Now, what underpins these differences in productivity um, is obviously differences in the technology that people use in different parts of the economy. And technology is a term that economists often don't define very well. So I'm going to define it for you. I'm going to say that technology is really knowledge, knowledge that takes uh, three forms. 
It's productive knowledge that we use for the purpose of transforming the world. It takes three forms. It takes the form of tools, uh, machines, materials that we use. We call that embodied knowledge because the knowledge to make the tool is already in the tool. You don't need to have it in your brain in order to use the tool. You, you just need to have it in the tool. So it's knowledge that is embodied in tools and materials. And there's codified knowledge in recipes, formulas, algorithms, how to do manuals, instructions. And as such, it exists in some uh, 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 symbolic space. Now, uh, tools are very easy to move around and codes are even easier to share. You just put them on the internet or you share them by email or you send them in a book. They're very easy to move around. But um, uh, there is a third form of knowledge that is going to generate all the difficulty in the action here, which is know-how. Here you have a dentist and the dentist uses tools. The dentist is probably following protocols, but the dentist mixes the tools and the protocols with something you and I don't have, which is the ability to look in, into the mouth and see things we otherwise wouldn't see, and the ability uh, to use her hands or his hands uh, with the tools to solve problems that we would not know how to do. So, so that third form of uh, knowledge, which call know-how, it's in brains and it's very, very hard to move into brains. And to illustrate that, I'm going to just show you here the great tennis, uh, Rafael Nadal. Uh, he knows how to play tennis, but I can guarantee you that uh, uh, interview or a conversation with Rafa Nadal is not going to improve your tennis game. So know-how is not something, it's not information that uh, changes brains by just reading or talking. It's a wiring of the brain that takes a long time to, uh, to acquire. And the problem with modern technology is that it requires not just uh, knowledge in one brain, it requires knowledge in many brains. So for example, you might say, that this uh, lady knows how to implement this technology. Uh, but the truth is that to implement this technology, you need all these other people. The technology requires a whole set of people to be able to, uh, to be implemented. You need to put different bits of knowledge in different brains and then bring those brains together. So we call collective knowledge, collective know-how, the ability to do things that can only be done by teams. And technology relies on collective know-how. Now, a collective know-how, the, the, the amount of collective know-how in products have, has been dramatically increasing. Here you have some traditional activities, and these traditional activities could be organized by families. Uh, these were mostly family business, and, and the know-how necessary to run the business was in the family. Uh, these products here cannot be done in a family. Uh, they require too much know-how that doesn't fit in a family. And you might say that this product has so much know-how that doesn't fit in a country. It's uh, the Boeing 787. It's done across all of these countries uh, through all of these corporations, and they all have to be brought together uh, to create uh, one aircraft, not many aircraft. They might do more aircraft, but to make the first aircraft, you would need all of them uh, in, to come together. So modern technology is a little bit like um, a symphonic orchestra where everybody brings a different bit of know-how, and the final result is the combination of that know-how. So I like to call this the Scrabble theory of development in the sense that these bits of know-how are like letters and then products are like words. And the way it works is that if you don't have too many letters, there aren't too many words you can make. If you have one letter, in this in the English language, you can only make one word. If you have these three letters, now you can make these four words and you can make three letter words. If I give you an extra letter, now you can make nine words and you can make four letter words. And if I give you these 10 letters, according to the Scrabble website, you can make 595 words that are up to 10 letters long. So the more letters you have, the more words you can put together and the longer the words. 
So in other, line, in other words, the more productive capability, the more productive know-how you have, the more diversified your country will be, the greater the variety of products it can make, and the longer the words it can make, the more complex products it can make. We developed a way of measuring how many letters a country has, and this is our index of economic complexity, and it shows uh, that uh, Indonesia uh, has a significant amount of economic complexity, maybe comparable to India, uh, slightly less than Thailand and China. Uh, but uh, I'm, I come from Venezuela that you see is quite pale, has very few letters. Uh, and we can do this at the subnational level. And this is uh, the amount of letters we estimate, you know, the different parts of, of Indonesia have. There are some parts that are highly, highly complex, like the Rio Islands. And, and, and Java. We also can relate this me metric of know-how, this economic complexity index, to how rich countries are. And you see, uh, controlling for natural resources, the more letters you have, if you want, on the x-axis, the richer you are here on the y-axis. But interestingly enough, this is not just a correlation, uh, because a uh, um, if you find here a country like India, you might say, you know, India is very far from the red line. It's India is poorer than the red line, while Greece is much richer than the red line. Well, guess what? I've intentionally made this graph with data from 2008, because since 2008, India has been growing a lot and Greece has been doing very poorly. So these distances between how many letters you are and how rich you are tend to be reduced over time. That countries that have more than enough letters to be richer than they are tend to grow faster. Countries that don't have enough letters tend to uh, grow more slowly or decline. Fortunately, we have Indonesia here. It's on the good side of this relationship. It has more than enough letters to be richer than it is. It just needs to express them. Now, this points to a strategy for development, which implies uh, acquiring more letters and combining them with the letters you already have and expressing them in more words and in longer words. But this faces a chicken and egg problem. And the chicken and egg problem comes from the fact that you cannot start doing new things, things that you haven't done before, because to do them, you need to know how to do them. But how do you learn how to do things that you don't do? You need watches, you need watchmakers to make watches, but how a person can become a watchmaker in a country that doesn't make watches. So the question is, how is this chicken and egg problem solved by economies? How do you move to new things? How do you innovate? This uh, intuition is deeply related to the question of which, uh, which animal is out of the group and which two animal be animals belong to each other. Well, if you apply the, the Scrabble metaphor, uh, you would say, well, um, a bear, a zebra is just a bear with a Z. So the distance from bear to zebra in Scrabble space is just one letter. Well, the different distance between bear and lion is huge because you, the bear has uses four letters that don't go into lion, and the lion uses four letters that you don't have. So this would suggest that moving moving from bear to zebra would just imply one chicken and egg problem, while moving from bear to lion it would be more difficult. It would require four chicken and egg problems, and it doesn't leverage any of the capabilities you already have. So to make sure use of this intuition, we develop sort of like a map of technology. And this map of technology is like a forest where every, every product is like a tree. And the relationship between uh, uh, products, the similarity, if you want, in the, in the capabilities needed by different products is, is related to how connected they are. And this is our product space. This is a, the, the map of the forest I was talking to you about. Here in green, uh, you have uh, garments. Here in brown, you have agro-processing. Here in red, you have construction materials. This is machinery here. These are chemicals, and these are electronics. 
And then there's a big periphery of very disconnected uh, products. Here up here is oil, here down here is mining. Um, now, uh, this, this view of technology um, allows us to at least measure two things about products. Uh, one is how complex are products and, and, and the complexity, uh, so you know, complex products are things like machinery, chemicals, electronics. Um, less complex are things like garments or oil. On the x-axis, uh, we can also measure connectedness. And connectedness means how, how close uh, are the trees in the forest? How connected are the products? If you know how to make one product, how easy it is for you to find another product that is you know, a short distance away, say from bear to zebra. So you see that this part of the forest here is very dense. This part of the forest here is very dense. So uh, it would say that machinery is as connected as garments, more or less, but machinery is, is uh, more complex. It's a longer word than, say, garments. So this already tells us a little bit about how, how, how progress might happen. Uh, we have applied this, uh, uh, this methodology not just to, uh, to goods uh, that are exported uh, through, you know, internationally, through customs and so on, uh, we have also applied it to all of production, including government, uh, healthcare, education, finance, etc. And this is a new industry map that we use uh, to try to map uh, where are uh, countries. Uh, now, uh, what is a country? What is a state? What is a city? What is a province? Um, well, in our mind, it is uh, it is uh, a set of firms that are able to implement uh, certain technologies. They are able to make certain products. So in our metaphor, a, a firm is going to be like a monkey that lives on a tree, on a tree in that forest. So we can characterize a country by where it has its firms in the product space. So I'm showing here uh, the product space again, and I'm highlighting in red the areas where Venezuela had comparative advantage in 2020. You see that there's very, very little color here, except for oil up here. There's very little that Venezuela is good at. I'm going to contrast Venezuela, which is a country of 30 million people, with uh, Austria, which is a country of 8 million people. And you see that Austria makes uh, a ton of goods. It makes a, a, it's incredibly diversified vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Venezuela. And I can show you uh, in Indonesia, and here is where Indonesia is in the in the product space so you see it's much more colorful than than venezuela it, it's much more diversified than venezuela but it's not as diversified as austria even though austria as i mentioned is a country of eight nine million people this is what uh, indonesia was exporting in 2020 it gives you an idea of how diverse is the export uh, basket of of uh, indonesia uh, and now that diversity is not equal across uh, across the archipelago. Uh, so this is East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, this is Aceh. Uh, uh, this is Riau Islands, and this is Jakarta. So there is an enormous diversity of uh, in capabilities in the different uh, in the different areas. Some uh, are are very uh, diversified; others are much less so. Uh, when we look uh, into this new industry space that I just mentioned before, I can, I can put in this space, I can put Jakarta and figure out where is uh, Jakarta in the product space. And you see that uh, it's quite uh, diversified. Here is a measure of intensity. It has a couple of very important clusters in, in that, in that space. And if we zoom into the manufacturing part, here is where uh, Jakarta has uh, capabilities. There's a lot of empty trees, if you want, places where there are very nearby, where the monkeys might be able to 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 jump to in 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 uh, hopefully soon. Um, now, do these monkeys move? Do these firms move in space? Well, yeah, fortunately, they do. What you have here is the export basket of Indonesia back in 1965. 
uh, and uh, the, the export basket of Indonesia just before COVID hit in 2019. And you see the export basket has gone up by a factor, uh, the exports have gone up by a factor of 250 since 1965. Uh, that's amazing, that's really impressive. But there's been a massive diversification of the export basket. You see that uh, it was all crude materials, fuels and, and food in, in 1965. And now you see material manufacturing, other manufacturing, machinery, um, chemicals, and so on. So um, uh, uh, we can see this in the product space. I'm going to show you uh, the monkeys jumping. This is Indonesia 1965, 75, 85, 95, 2000, 2005, 10, 15, 20. So you see there's been a lot of movement, a lot of diversification in in this in in this process and if you and I'll show you to you once more go back to 65 notice that jumps tend to be to nearby trees so nearby products so the idea is that knowing where you are now can facilitate figuring out what to do next typically you want to choose things that are relatively near your current capabilities but that are more attractive either because they're more complex or because they offer further uh, diversification opportunities going uh, forward. Now, let me benchmark a little bit what Indonesia has done. Let me compare it to other places. So in South Korea, for example, this is South Korea's market share in the world. That is a world market share in textiles, electronics, and machinery. You see South Korea got early on into textiles and then moved into electronics and then machinery. And in that process, it abandoned uh, uh, partially textiles. Uh, here's Thailand, it got into textiles, then very massively into electronics and then to machinery. And again, sort of like abandoned textiles uh, partially. They're still there, but not as intensely as they were before they moved on to electronics and, and machinery. This is China, it moved on to textiles, then on to electronics and machinery. Notice that China seems to be always getting into things and hasn't been able, hasn't been getting out of many things. So, but uh, this is Malaysia got to electronics much more intensely than into uh, garments or, or machinery. Um, but now machinery is as, at least as, as large as garments. Um, uh, and here is Indonesia. It got into, into garments. Um, it started to get into electronics. It didn't move into electronics as, as high relative to its presence in, in garments. And, uh, and it's, it's getting into machinery, but, but its market share in, in textiles is, is orders of magnitude bigger. And this suggests a transformation that has not been as intense as in other places. Uh, and this shows in the number of new products that uh, the country has gotten into in the last 15 years. Uh, we count 15 new products that have added only $7 billion compared to say Vietnam that added 44 uh, products that added $122 billion. So in uh, the process of diversification, I think it uh, has a lot that it can contribute uh, to further dynamize and increase uh, the adoption of technology and the movement towards more complex goods. Uh, let me uh, let me talk uh, about a couple of other themes that I see uh, uh, for the country going forward. Um, one uh, one of them is that uh, this is data for the world. This is world GDP, uh, world exports of goods and world exports of services in, since 2000. You see that uh, exports have been growing faster than GDP. That's the black line of goods, but export of services has been growing much faster than, than GDP. So, uh, so the service sector is, in, in even in international trade, is becoming more significant. We see something like it in, in Indonesia. The export uh, the, uh, uh, services grew in line with and a little bit faster than GDP until the pandemic hit. So it's uh, a, 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 a services, a, and these are export services have been have been a, growing dynamically. But we observe that services globally a, are are changing a, a, in nature. 
a, a, on the left, I have the imports of U.S. services. And what has been growing from very low levels, but has been growing enormously, is the exports of the imports of cultural services. This is the impact of Netflix, uh, uh, Amazon Prime, and so on. There's a lot of uh, cultural products that are being imported in the U.S. And the next is the rise of business services. Here I took cultural services on the right and took cultural services out so we can uh, look at a better indication uh, of, of, of growth. And you see that business services um, have been uh, uh, growing much faster than the traditional sectors of transport and tourism and insurance. So uh, these business services uh, are um, being facilitated by the fact that um, uh, things are increasingly done remotely. That it used to be that many tasks you needed to co-locate with uh, other parts of the production process in the same place, but now things can be done remotely. And I, I show you here this ad that you put together to attract people to Bali, these uh, digital nomads. But it's not just digital nomads that are moving. Uh, there are many industries that are uh, teleworkable that um, uh, where, where the work does not have to happen in an office, it can be done remotely. And you see here the scientific and research and development, publishing, computer system design, legal services, insurance carriers, and so on. These activities are increasingly being able to be done remotely. So we did last year a study for Colombia asking ourselves, Given that these value chains are going are being deconstructed, and many of these value chains are related to to things that used to be inside manufacturing firms, but now have become uh, tertiarized services that supply these manufacturing firms or that take the output of these manufacturing firms, and, and we found a set of of, of services that uh, were in great demand globally and where um, Colombia had sufficient human capital. I'm I'm wondering what this would look like for Indonesia. That is, what are all the things that could happen in, in, in basing the activity in Indonesia, but where the production process can be happening anywhere in the world and these activities can be done remotely. Other things that are moving in this direction are, are these new digital platforms. There is a, a company in, in Latin America called Tienda Nube, uh, which is um, uh, now has become a, um, a unicorn. It's a, a company that simply helps SMEs sell through platforms like, uh, like uh, uh, Amazon or, or the like. We have a, an equivalent uh, to Amazon in, in Latin America. And that means that SMEs can easily become exporters by just digitizing their, their information networks and connecting to these other platforms. And this transforms the opportunity set of SMEs enormously. I won't tell you more about Gojek because you know more about Gojek than, than I do, but it, it helps connect firms to customers that they would not otherwise be able to connect. And it helps connect workers, people willing to work to tasks that uh, firms need need to happen. So it's a it's a, a, an enormous transformation that facilitates the fusion. And I mentioned here Lenovo because Lenovo is a company that started just assembling the ThinkPad for IBM, and uh, step by step by just you know starting from one part of the value chain, expanded to to design and procurement and and distribution and branding and so on. Uh, so. So this uh, this process of, of 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 transformation can be done more parsimoniously, more gradually by participating in value chains. I want to see I want to say something about green growth. I saw also Indonesia very much discussed in the context of COP twenty seven. Uh, I saw I, I saw very interesting announcements immediately post COP twenty seven. Uh, relating to Indonesia, and I wanted to reflect a little bit about how to think of growth in the context of uh, global warming and decarbonization. We know that there's a very tight relationship between how rich countries are and how much energy they use, um, and uh, and that's that's just a characteristic of of of, of production and growth. 
Uh, the problem is that uh, a lot of the growth in energy worldwide has been coming from uh, uh, carbon-related products like coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, and this has led to this problem of, of emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, I like very much this graph because it shows you uh, how much each country is emitting. On the x-axis, you have what's the population, and on the y-axis, you have what is the emissions per capita? So those, the area of the square is, um, is, is total emissions. And, and the color is how much they have been, these emissions have been growing. So you see here is Indonesia, it's about 2% of global emissions. It's not more than that. So if you were to eliminate all emissions tomorrow, uh, only 2% of global emissions would go down. Uh, it, uh, Indonesia's emissions are much lower than the average per capita emission, okay? Um, uh, but they have been growing very fast. And they have been growing very fast because there's been a big increase in coal production uh, and natural gas. There's been some reduction in, in oil production. So these are the things that uh, uh, the world is asking you to, to focus on decarbonization. But the interesting thing, and I was quite impressed by this, is that you have an enormous uh, potential for renewable energy. Uh, you're, losing, you're using less than 0.5% of your solar potential, uh, less than 6% of your uh, hydro potential, and less than 0.5% of your wind potential. Now, so that means that there's a potentially significant energy transformation to take place in, in uh, Indonesia. I'm wanting to think about uh, what opportunities for manufacturing growth does that generate? And here, uh, I would like to paraphrase uh, John F. Kennedy, who said, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm, I'm going to say it differently. Ask not what you're, you can do to decarbonize your country. Ask what your country can do to decarbonize the world. Uh, uh, to help the, how, what your country can do to help the world decarbonize. Now, the decarbonization. So instead of looking narrowly at the emissions of Indonesia, why don't we look at what the world needs to do to lower its emissions and how we can insert Indonesia in providing the things that the world will need for the world to decarbonize. Now, global emissions are associated with 31% come from the use of, of um, carbon emitting uh, fuels in manufacturing. 27% come from electricity, 19% from agriculture, 16% from transportation, and 17% from buildings. Now, in order to lower those emissions, uh, the world will need to electrify anything that can be electrified and to make that electricity in, in clean ways. It will need to develop alternative fuels that are green, like hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, green hydrocarbons, biofuels, etc. It, it needs to eliminate emissions from the manufacturing process. And some of those emissions are not about energy use, but are about the chemical reactions that happen in the process of manufacturing. And so some of these reactions will need to capture and sequester the carbon. And there are huge uncertainties over how to accomplish uh, all of these tasks. But it seems to me quite obvious that there is no way in which the world will be able to electrify without a mining boom. Electrification will require a huge set of minerals, uh, starting from copper, aluminum, in nickel, in lead, in obviously lithium, and so on. And it, those minerals will have to be transformed into metals and transformed into the tools that allow for decarbonization. And that is a, a one thing that we know for certain that if there's going to be um, um, uh, uh, a decarbonization, there has to be an electrification boom and there'll have to be a mining boom that accompanies. And fortunately, Indonesia is the country with the largest known nickel reserves in the world. And the expectation is that in the next 12 years, if the world is to decarbonize, in, in, in nickel production will have to go up worldwide by 200%. And it's a critical uh, input for battery production. So 
So one important question is what are the set of things that the world is going to be demanding to decarbonize and that can be done in, in Indonesia? Another theme that I think is very important is what I like to call the, the end of the energy flat world. Uh, uh, oil is a product that has been, and coal too, are products that are amazingly energy dense. They're, as a consequence, super easy to transport. In this graph, you see how much energy these different products pack per, per unit of weight and on the y-axis per unit of volume. And coal and oil have an exquisite mix of being incredibly dense per unit of weight and volume. Uh, ethanol, LNG are about half as dense. And methanol and liquid ammonia are even less. Hydrogen is, is, is very uh, energy dense per unit of, of weight, but it is a gas. And so it's very, very uh, 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 not dense in, in unit of volume. And if you want to make it denser, you have to compress it and liquefy it. And this takes an enormous amount of energy. So you waste a lot of energy trying to make it compact. And that means that moving hydrogen is much, much costlier than moving coal or oil. It's a little bit like, a, you know, cost of move. It's worse than moving a LNG. And LNG is already very costly to, to move. And that's why LNG prices are about $6 per million BTU in the U.S., $6 per million BTU. And they're about $100 in Europe. Uh, there is no no uh, no law of one price in 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 these things now the fact that uh, the world was energy flat because of oil meant that energy poor countries say like germany belgium japan could become a, a could develop comparative advantage in energy intensive products like steel so you could get into energy intensive activities even if you didn't have energy because it was very cheap to transport that energy because that energy was essentially oil. But in the world today, a, a energy is a, a renewable energy is going to be much, much harder to, uh, to, uh, to move. So energy intensive activities will want to locate near places that are rich in green energy. So um, I think this is a, a, a very important message. I already uh, see it uh, being implemented in Indonesia. You have uh, plans to have a hydropower uh, aluminum plant. Uh, hydro is an amazingly uh, uh, useful thing. It has the advantage that you know, with a dam, it's dispatchable. So you can use it when you need it, not when, when the rain falls. And as a consequence, it is a particularly valuable source of energy. But in general, I would say, given the amount of energy, renewable energy potential you have, the world is going to be looking for places that have green energy to be able to make the things that are currently done in energy poor countries, activities that will want to move out of there because it will be very costly to move green energy into those places. So summing up, I want to say that economic development results from the adoption of technology, that societies accumulate technology by putting different bits of know-how in different heads, uh, that technology faces chicken and egg problems, uh, that these chicken and egg problems causes change to be relatively parsimonious. Uh, uh, the, the, mark, the world tends to like to go from bear to zebra and not from bear to lion. It likes more parsimonious changes to build on your capabilities and add some capabilities more gradually. Uh, manufacturing offers this dual advantage of being both complex and having a, a like um, a stairway of complexity in highly connected activities. So it makes progress easier because it's very, very connected. And so it's easier to move from one area uh, to another. Indonesia as a whole is very well positioned in the product space. Uh, not all regions of Indonesia, some parts of Indonesia uh, are better uh, placed for uh, continued progress than, than others. So challenges are very different uh, in, the, in the different parts of the archipelago. Um, manufacturing value chains are being split up 
into different tasks, and these tasks can now be done remotely through telework and other means. And so a lot of what used to be inside manufacturing firms is now being relabeled as business services. They form part of the same value chain, but they're done in different places. I think this is an enormous opportunity for growth. And finally, decarbonization offers new areas of comparative advantage for Indonesia to get ahead on, on, on opportunities for green growth by making the tools that allow others to decarbonize uh, like uh, nickel and batteries and other things I'm sure will be growing very fast in the coming decades. And by making energy intensive things locally with green energy, like the example of aluminum with, with hydro. Uh, let me stop there. It's been an honor to have been able to share these ideas with you and I'm looking forward to your comments.